So my name is Clémence, Clem, um, and I work for QLegal. So we are a law clinic. We're based at Queen Mary um, Legal Advice Center, and we provide free legal advice to startups and entrepreneurs. So today I'm going to start by telling you a bit more about what we do and how we do it, and then I'll go into um, basically clients we've helped, uh, what kind of legal issue they had, a lot of them are developers, and how we help them uh, with their businesses and legal issues. So, uh, first of all, sorry, yay. So, um, yeah, just a disclaimer, I'm not a solicitor, so th this does not constitute legal advice, I have to say this. <laughs> um, so what we do, we do free legal advice, um, and how we do that is we uh, select and train master law students, and we pair them in two, um, and they're supervised by solicitors. So they meet with clients, and then they draft advice, they get feedback, so they learn in a way, it's good practical experience, um, and then uh, it's all free for everyone else, so it's pretty cool. Uh, and we're also part of a network called iLink, so it's basically law clinics based all over Europe that does pretty much the same as us. Um, and at the moment, we receive funding for developing a program uh, called eHealth Hub, uh, supporting eHealth startups uh, in Europe. So that's going to come up soon. Is that actually... Yeah, that's better. So what we do is legal advice directly. We also do workshops in co-working spaces, universities, schools, uh, and we write legal updates uh, about current topics. Um, the type of clients that we help are usually um, startups, uh, but also social enterprises, software researchers and developers, and SMEs. Um, and lastly, our outreach programs are Teach Tech Law, which is um, initially started in the US. So it's basically master law students going into school uh, with uh, kids from underprivileged underprivi underprivi background and teaching them about uh, law and entrepreneurship, giving them the will and the skills to um, actually go for it. Um, Another program that we run is a law and technology externship. So our law students going into a law tech startups to learn about how uh, technology is, is disrupting the uh, legal um, industry. And then the last one is a transatlantic patent project um, in partnership with a US university. Our students are working on a um, hypothetical patent invention, uh, an invention that they would like to patent and they're learning um, about it, how to do it in the US and the, in the UK. So, getting into it. Um, today, I'm going to talk about points to consider when you work with a startup and you're a developer, um, the processes for patenting a software and for licensing it, basically making money, and then uh, for working with, with universities. So, if you're developing something in the course of your employment, um, does it have an, an impact on the ownership of the IP rights? It does. Big spoiler alert. Um, so, our first client uh, was actually, sorry, a bit behind on this. Um, so, our first client uh, came to us. She was developing an e health tech product uh, to help pa patients um, manage their diabetes by themselves. So, she wasn't a developer, but she was learning to code to develop her first prototype but she was also thinking about maybe hiring a third-party developer down the line. So she had issued about how do I protect what I'm developing and what happens if I hire someone and uh, that person creates code. Who is owning the IP rights and can I kind of transfer that ownership? Um, so can I have a quick show of hands? Who is really comfortable with the notion of copyrights? As in like, should I just do quick, yeah, you feel really confident. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Should I just do a quick uh, review of what it is? Cool. So copyright is actually really cool IP right because you don't need to register it. So that's the only one, I mean not the only one, but that's an IP right where you don't need to go to an office, kind of write lots of paper and pay money to get your IP rights. Um, copyright arises on the, basically on the head of the, of the um, maker. So when you, when you uh, inventing something, then automatically you have copyright. But what, what it means is that it's really hard to prove it, so you don't, you don't own a, a copyright. Um, whereas for a patent, you're gonna pay for a patent, but then you have an actual paper that says that you have it, if that makes sense. Um, 
So the copyright, it lasts for about 50 years, actually exactly 50 years, um, and it used to um, apply only for, for example, literary work. But as it evolves, it now applies also to computer programs, uh, like source code and object code, but also uh, to preparatory design material, such as uh, the functional specification, the graph, and the flowcharts. So, for instance, so you can protect the original expression of the ID, but not the ID itself. So, for instance, you're going to protect, uh, if you're developing a dating app, you're going to protect the source code, but you can't protect the concept of like matching people online by copyright. Yeah, question? Suppose I, I have a thermometer I, and I enable it to focus all the data that is generated, right? So, so it measures the temperature every 10 seconds. Do I have the copyright on the data I'm generating or not? Sorry, just so that I understand, you are collecting data yeah. which you are then, then sharing. Yeah, I'm publishing, yes. Yeah. So, it's a good question because I'm not actually covering in use case studies. Um, I guess the question is like what type of data? I'm, I'm not specializing, I, I'm not sure if you can develop a bit on that, but I wonder if it's just generic data, if there is any originality, so it needs to be a, an originality. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, just all move you, <laughs> you up. <laughs> there a bit of movement in there. No, not working? Okay. I just feel like Beyonce on the, on the stage. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, you were saying? So, so I'm just wondering, because I mean, the, the whole thing is about the internet of things, right? This is uh, enabling the fridge. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can have a fair thing, you're publishing data all the time. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you can actually own that data or, or, or not. I mean, so, so, so it's good, it's simple. But it's yeah. Whenever you're publishing data, so is your question, can, can, can copyright protect databases or yeah, just the data, data itself? Data well, my simple answer, although I'm sure it would be more, much more complicated if I was to look into it, would be no, just because if it's generic data that you collected in itself, it's not something you created, something that you collected. And then the legal implication would be more towards uh, data protection, so are you a data controller? Or pro and that's not something I'm going to cover today, but it's, uh, it's like an, another legal issue. Um, and something else I want to say is, if you have any legal issue, feel free to come and find me, because we do help people for free. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so where was I? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say quickly um, that basically the first owner of the copyright is the person who actually developed the code. So if you hire someone, that even if you're the owner of the company, that person will be the owner of the code. So if you want that IP rights vested in your company, assigned to your company, you need to um, have a contract in place which is called a deed of assignment um, and it needs to be really specific but it can also be limited so you can only assign, uh, for example, uh, a part of the copyright, so the right to copy or you can limit it in time so it's, um, yeah, customizable. Um, the second um, startup we helped um, it's more going to be about patents. So that um, entrepreneur developed a medical app to help uh, faster diagnosis uh, using card cardiological tests. So there was this app and there was another app which was about a medical communication network. And it's really interesting because there is <coughs> the same kind of criteria for patentability but they apply differently to these two cases. So the first um, our students um, looked into the issue and they found that um, the client was able to protect the aspect of the algorithm uh, which were new, non obvious and provide a technical effect because they looked at how the software was used together with the hardware to provide technical effects. Um, so, but then the communication platform, um, it wasn't, they weren't able to patent it because there were other communication platforms existing already and it was harder to convince the patent office that the ID uh, involved an inventive step. Um, so regarding patents, uh, quickly, two facts to remember. Uh, first is that uh, one in 20 applicants uh, get a patent without uh, professional help. So it's one of the IPOs that's hardest to get, um, but it's also quite expensive. Uh, if you get professional help to draft the patent application, it will typically take about 
between four and eight thousand pounds uh, to have a successful application. Um, so, the other, that, sof that case uh, is a really interesting one. Uh, it was a um, social enterprise, um, and they developed uh, video games for uh, blind and uh, partially sighted people. And um, they had lots of legal issues, and among them, they wanted to know how do I protect confidential information using non-disclosure agreement? Uh, what, are the patent pr like what are the processes for patenting a software? And what, are the difference, what is the difference between assigning and licensing my IP rights? And those issues were really important because we followed up afterwards and they were telling us, thank God we had the advice because that really helped us kind of putting our business to the next level and finding new clients. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a tale now, the tale of the perfect non-disclosure agreement. Um, <laughs> so the world is not perfect, but this story will be. Um, so it's, really, it's a sunny day, you're going out there and you're going to meet an investor. And you want this, get, this day to go really well. So your investor will sign a non-disclosure agreement so that your business goes well. Um, first of all, the client would have listed all of the information he plans to disclose to his investors so that all of them have been recorded in writing. So that could be in um, written, that could be drawn, that could be even screenshot of an application. Um, and all of this will be printed out. Second thing is that the investor will then sign all of the printouts to confirm that they've seen it. Um, this way, the client has turned his valuable ideas into physical pieces of information and the, investors has, the investor has expressly confirmed both his agreement to the NDA and that he acknowledged uh, the exact information that I covered. So basically, everything the client has told the investors is written down so that bulletproof, yeah. What happens if the investor just reads the non-disclosure agreement and then just because I'm guessing, can you list without disclosing? So can you name what you will be disclosing? You know what I mean? Can you name the data of no, 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 without disclosing that data? Does that make sense? My second point is, if this is a really sensitive topic, you might want to get legal advice to draw that agreement so that that kind of scenario doesn't happen. And then the last thing is negotiation. It happens really often that people get to us like, they don't want to sign our NDA, and it's like, well, you know, it, there's a lot of kind of human negotiation that legal advice cannot really bring to you. But <laughs> um, cool. I had a little bit on patent, sof like software patent processes. So if there's like a real big eagerness in the room, I'm happy to go through it. If not, I might just like move to assignment and licensing, like it's up to you guys. What do you think, Shay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Cool, because that's my favorite one. So. Cool. So, do you guys know what's the difference between assignment and licensing your IP rights? That's cool. That's why. Yeah, you do? You want to go for it? Um, licensing tells people that they can, be, you give them permission to do certain things maybe with some restrictions, um, whereas assignment effectively turns them into you, so you either share it with them or give it over to them, and you shouldn't do that passion. Yeah, absolutely. So that's absolutely right. Um, in licensing, you see, yes! <laughs> <laughs> you see um, a licensor which um, still retain ownership of <coughs> that IP rights, and then um, kind of decide to um, a relinquish part of it for a certain period of time, for a certain amount of money, to the licensee. In assignment, um, the IP right is effectively completely removed from one to the other. So usually that will happen um, when companies hire someone to do something and then they just don't want to kind of leave, leave that IP right in the nature and they want it to be vested in the company. Um, so that three main uh, type of licenses, for instance, um, it can be exclusive, so only the licensee can use it. It can be both parties using it, or it can be non-exclusive, which means that the licensor can uh, sell it to different licensees at the same time. Um, and the last thing is 
as I, I was just saying earlier, it's quite important to seek legal advice when you draft a deed of assignment or license clause, just because um, you might have further complication if that's not properly done, because it needs to be quite specific to be enforceable. Um, Yay! So that's the case where uh, Shoaib came to us for a research piece. <laughs> so we're effectively our clients. Um, so it wasn't about you know helping a startup, but uh, Shoaib had a question about um, how can we make software openly available while limiting uh, the liability of researchers. So it was really interesting, and our students spent a bit more time uh, doing research on this. Um, so. The first thing is, what time is it? I still have, yeah, okay. Um, so we've seen that, you know, the owner of the copyright is the per first person who developed it and then it can be, um, can be vested in the company and, and licensed. Um, so basically using someone's IP right without their consent uh, creates infringement. So what are the exceptions? There's two exceptions to this actually. Um, so there's fair dealing in private study, but actually it's not really useful for developers because uh, it's not broad enough to allow other developers to eff effectively use the program to advance their research. So that means that under fair dealing, for example, a developer cannot work on decompiling a program, so they cannot uh, build on the copyrighted work, so that's really not useful. Um, and then also, um, the European and UK law is um, is still the interpretation is still subject to change, so that means that it might it might be um, uh, legal to do it now, but it might not be in the future. So that uncertainty doesn't help um, encouraging people to kind of share the result of their research. So then we have um, open source licenses versus public domain. So those are like two really different things. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware of open source software. <laughs> um, so basically to be able um, to share that work, you would use open source licenses. The requirement of open source licenses are free redistribution of the software as a component of an aggregate software distribution. Um, it needs to include the source code and it needs to allow modifications and deri deri uh, derivative works. Um, and Almost all, um, almost all open software licenses uh, contain kind of a provision reducing or definitely excluding entire liability of the developer. So that means that um, if you then use that kind of software through license and you get a loss resulting from the software being unstable or having malfunctions, um, the user will bear entirely the cost of any dam damage incurred. Um, but then the SSI wanted to know if there is another way <laughs> to share uh, software openly and more anonymously. So we looked into public domain. And public domain is a really kind of interesting term, but it's not legally defined. So there is no statutory definition. Um, and it traditionally refers to works that is not protected by copyright law. So it's basically uh, a space where there is no legal regulation. And for law people like us, we just hate it because it's not regulated. Um, and so it has kind of a negative space. It's kind of negatively seen. Um, also because, okay, it's public domain, but that also means that no permission is required to use the author's creation. Um, and nevertheless, um, the desires of researchers and developers to avoid liability while sharing results with the ac academic community has led to an increased interest in the, in the public domain. But you should be wary of a few things if you're interested in that. Um, first of all, it's not settled in UK law whether an author can voluntarily give up copyright. Um, and second of all, even if the court was to decide it was, or if we would arrive to the same um, kind of similar results uh, by drafting, for instance, um, unrestricted and irrevocable license and a pr promise not to sue for infringement, there will still be risk um, to relinquish those IP rights. So first of all, um, anyone can use um, public domain material for any purpose. So it means that if you develop 
a software, am I even speaking in this? No. Um, then the person using it afterwards might not respect your original aim and um, whereas with a license you can explicitly, explicitly limit the purpose for which the code can be further developed. Um, there is no guarantee that the original developer will be able to retain credit for his work. There is no obligation to credit actually the original programmer in their deri derivative work. So that might not encourage people to share more. Um, and then lastly, the owner of a creation derived from public domain material will have IP protection. So there is no guarantee that they decide to give it back to the community uh, again. They might just um, make money out of it. Um, so despite being a mean to facilitating creativity and innovation, public domain release in comparison to um, open source license can potentially result in a less efficient means to allow further development. Is there any question at this point? Oh, yeah. So in that case, it's similar, I mean, if I do something public domain or if I do something with a PSD license that I don't care where the people are going to use it afterwards, uh, the, only thing that I, the, only thing, the only thing that difference the both is that in one of them I have a recognition, right? Yeah. The issue is that the issue is that you can't you can't in the in UK law you can't get rid of liability completely. Yeah, but if you have a if, uh, you write a book and then two years afterwards you lose the copyright, it's the same thing. So yeah, but fifty years is pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 the, the copyright is fires in fifty years. Yeah. It's fifty years after you death. Uh, for literary work, for that one, it's um, 50 years after the year the work was created. So at, at the end of the year, it was created. So, that, so if I write a piece of code and I don't write a license about the code, it's only be protected by the copyright. So 50 years later, it's fully domain. I think the issue, the issue isn't about uh, credit. The issue is why would you want to play in a public domain? It's not fair for you, but it doesn't seem to make sense. <coughs> People well, say because you don't care. Well, no, no, it's not so much a matter of not caring. It's more of an issue of you limit, you're trying to limit liability. Because if you, if you write some open source code, put it on GitHub, someone took it and used it for pacemaker or something like that, yeah. they could sue you. Why? Because you, you can't limit liability on things like that. But if I write a license and they say, I, it I don't, it's, I not applicable, it's not applicable. That, that's the point. You can't say that in UK law. No, no, but if you write the license, you, you use it as a term which isn't effective. So the, the, the license is useless? No, the, your limitation, your, 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 your yeah, to yeah. which you're limiting liability is not possible. Oh, okay. That's why, that's why the question arose about putting something in the public domain, because then it wouldn't be yours anyway, it would be in the public space, so there would be an attempt at limiting liability. So the only way to get around that is just put it in in a place with like, another one, and then no one knows who was you. And then you lose credit. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, but if I put something in the public domain, it's because I don't care my credit, I think. So that, that's what this question is about. Yeah. So, can I ask, so are you saying that when you publish software with a GPL license, which specifically say it was published with no warranty and no liability, that that's meaningless? In UK law, it's meaningless. That's it. <coughs> The shit. Nothing to pay. <laughs> That's why this question arose. I can, you, know, you can publish. The, I think maybe one thing that we need to do is publish the longer response that we received. Yeah, we could. Yeah, I mean, it's yours now. <laughs> <laughs> In a release of IP, right? <laughs> Has anyone actually gotten to call any precedents for this question? Yeah, is it actually has it ever happened, or is it just a legal thing? Sorry. Has it actually happened that someone's been prosecuted for something kind of trend <coughs> or for open source software? being used far beyond what they anticipated. So my answer is going to be I don't know. Uh, but it is very possible that it hasn't, but then it's just a legal theory, and that's what we love to do, like just knowing it might be happening, and it never d d does, but it's just a possibility. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. A, that's a good point. <laughs> See, that's, that's, I mean, the point about this question is because that's everyone's default understanding is, well, I've got a GPL license on it. See, I think if that, if 
that would seem, if we make that very clear to a lot of researchers, it could really hurt the sort of open software survival because they'll say, well, at the moment I don't publish my code, so there is no way I could ever be sued. Yeah. If I publish my code and somebody uses my code and someone dies, then it could be on me. Well, then I won't publish my code. Is, it, is that an unrealistic? I, I, that had never occurred to me, and now now I know about it. I'm thinking, damn! I'm looking through my GitHub thing, thinking I haven't done anything important now. Like, if I have, I need to revoke that code. That's the uh, that's why we were trying to understand. Mm. Again, they, they don't, yeah. Even if somebody was using it on Amazon and I hadn't designed it, that would have been to go into the door or they... So this is all, this is all theoretical. None of this is like, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Not yet. You should go on. Yeah, you should go and do a petition. Are there? I mean, for, for those of us, I mean, uh, who are paranoid, just sort of think in the UK. I can imagine in the UK that good sense would prevail, but then I sort of think about Who <laughs> 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 <We> did? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you know, you know how the teachers it gets in the US, right? So, I mean, do, and because code's international, what? Does that mean that if, if, I, if I publish code and can I be sued by someone in the US? Sorry, um, guys, I'm just mindful of the time. Um, have you, well, I just have one more case and we have two questions there. Do you want to go ahead? To make it simple. <laughs> Where does this leave us if it's in Do you mean in terms of, of the jurisdictions and yeah, the liability? Well, uh, you know, the key to the more general question is, is how, um, how much do you need to sort of cross the national yeah. boundaries? So I'm going to try to answer this without giving any legal advice. Um, it, it's definitely something you should consider. Um, basically, jurisdiction is decided in the contract. So it's something you need to negotiate and then decide whether it's going to be UK law or French law or Swiss law. Um, so, sorry? So there will be a clause of jurisdiction saying um, in the event of any... Uh, I shouldn't be saying this. Uh, generally, what happens in contracts is um, that you would um, you would have a, a clause usually at the end saying, um, in the event of any um, uh, issues arising, these the issues will be resolved under French law, UK law, Swiss law. Um, yeah. Then at the end of the day, UK and French law must not be that different, as in you you can you can expect them to be pretty much harmonised. But you should definitely choose at least in which jurisdiction the. Um, the, um, the issue would be resolved. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, was there another question there? Uh, there, was, there was almost the same the idea that if the code is stored somewhere else than the UK, it's not a problem. Or that was kind of the same 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Then the issue, I guess, is, I mean, would it happen? Like, you know, in theory, yes. In practically, it would, it would sound quite complex. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop in there. I'm just going to finish quickly with the last um, kind of case study, which was um, <laughs> uh, a client that came to us, and she was working for... Um, I'm going to try to be really generic on that one because um, I hope no one in, in this room <laughs> um, is from that university. So she was working as a researcher. Uh, well, um, so she was hired by UK University um, and she also kind of created her own private company. And she, the condition of her research work was to develop her product um, so that she mm, then that product might be marketed by her former employer. So the former employers had uh, expectation that uh, they would kind of own the IP of that product eventually. So the question was, um, does the employer has any claim on the work developed? And was that work developed in the course of the client's employment? Um, the, the bad answer was like, we were going through it and it was definitely the case. So sometimes you have to tell your client, actually, I'm so sorry, but you know, you're wrong. There's nothing we can do for you. Um, but it was really interesting to look into why it was the case. Um, and really the courts, there's lots of uh, jurisprudence like cases in, in this area. Um, and the, the court does a case by case analysis. Um, they're looking at the scope of the employment. Um, was it doing office hour? Was it using material provided at the employee's, employer's expenses? Was it, was it for the employer's benefits or at the employer's request? Um, and so our kind of solution and answer to the client was, uh, you can either continue with your research grant uh, source of funding and share the commercialization of the product with the previous employer, or you should uh, use an independent source of funding, or you should close your private company uh, which business plan is based on a report um, developed while you were in employment. Does that make sense? Is there any question regarding that case? Where did this happen when the employee was working on something extremely closely related to what they were paid for? Yes. I, I, guess, I guess it's it can happen that you do your work and you're realizing what you're employed for, but then an ID arrives that, oh, I could make money doing something related to it. Yeah. So in a way, you're having the ID for yourself, but it is definitely kind of spinning out your current employment. And that's a really hard line to draw because you're like, it's my idea. I've developed that report by myself, but practically the court will look at you know, evidence. So you need to be pretty careful when you do that. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> I've seen a few cases, and when you, when you, but it's, it's, it's honestly, it's uh, understandable that universities, you know, especially giving lots of grants and expanding their research, want to see the fruits of that research. So, um, and lastly, it's just really legal health check. So it's tough to think about uh, for software developers, uh, like making sure you have a contract in place before anyone produces any content or code. Um, and that includes even, you know, putting images on your website or using content from uh, online sources. Um, also understand what you're able to do in the course of your employment to retain ownership of your IP rights. Um, your non-disclosure agreement should contain standard clauses and clearly define what confidential information are. Um, the purpose and aim of licensing the code. And then... Um, Understanding the implication of terms of IP right ownership uh, of signing a research contract with a UK institution. Um, and then really talking to you, if that, if that happens to you, talking to your institution and seeking legal advice um, is really important. Do you guys have any questions for me? Yeah? I mean, yeah. are people coming back here? They're only coming back here. Yeah, so... Um, so my question actually finishes on... Um, so, you know, 
some of the, the question about, you know, if you have three developers. So I work on projects where, you know, there's 150 developers. Yeah. So, like, they, uh, you know, say, Astrofy, NumPy, SciPy, projects like that. All of those come to in their license. So in the license, uh, they actually put at the top copyright, and then they write the years, and then they put things like NumPy developers or Astrofy developers, but not actual names of people. Mm. Is that a problem? And how do you deal with <coughs> you might when you have such large collaborations? That's a really good point. I've never come across that before. Um, I guess what you touched upon is how do you prove that you're owner of the copyright? So why d why are we putting the sign of you know the C? Well, yeah, it's and that, yeah. Sorry, and who owns the copyright? But yeah. Is that when someone like you know you have a, a one of the files in the source code has been edited by 20 people? You know, do you own the exact line? You you know how how does that work? Um, so I wouldn't be able to answer you too specifically, no, but I guess the issue, <laughs> I guess the issue is, um, as I said before, you know, you pay for a pattern and you get your, your piece of paper that says this is your pattern. With copyright, because you haven't registered it, you need to prove it. So basically, you don't have a title, but you're the owner of that copyright until proven otherwise. So basically, you should keep trace of your work so that if one day someone says, oh, I did that before you, you can say, well, I have this work and I've put a C on it for, you know, since like, I don't know, 1999. So obviously, I was the real owner. Um, so that's the usual answer. When you have multiple developers on it, I actually never come across that. So is, it, is that, can open source projects approve your legal advice or actual official advice? Absolutely. So how we work is, uh, just a quick disclaimer, we don't do tax, we don't do insurance, and we don't do employment law. Uh, but, uh, and also we advice from October to March, so we're actually closing at the moment, but we do have ad hoc session on the summer. But I would really encourage you to reach out to us, because we also select clients on how interesting the cases are, and I'm sure it would be. <laughs> so uh, definitely, um, you can, yeah, I can give you my business card at the end. Yeah, all done for me. Thank you, guys.